read this passage, this will be now the third week in a row. Two weeks in a row this passage came up. I thought that was a, a good thing. And maybe God's saying something. Maybe. I don't know. Um, you know, the Bible says that everybody, everybody, you and I, everybody else who has claimed salvation does so through grace alone. So by grace, through faith. And Paul makes it abundantly clear, I think, that we remain in salvation by grace too. It's not something we start by grace and finish some other way. Unless I've read his letter to the Galatians wrong for the last 30 years. I was browsing online the other day, browsing Kurong the other day. I, I don't know. I don't know what was going on in my head, but I looked for books written solely by Ravi Zacharias. Remember Ravi Zacharias? I looked for books written solely by him. You know, he died, oh, he passed away last year, last year, was it? Last year. He was exposed as a, a sexual predator. Most of his sins didn't come out until after he passed away. He was acclaimed by many as being the leading uh, apologist of the 21st century before then. Now you can't find a book solely written by him. I remember how I, I felt when I heard the news of his fall. I couldn't believe it. I thought people were making this up. But um, it took me a while to absorb its significance. I thought about the people who had built their life on what he had said and how devastating that would be to them. One of the questions that were asked were, how could he continue in ministry if he was doing that stuff for such a long time? Where is his integrity? <coughs> On that same day, <laughs> I was praying about this sermon because sometimes I wish I would belong to the Lutherans or Somebody else, and they tell you what you have to preach on. <laughs> Thinking about what to preach on today, praying about the sermon, what I should, what it should be, and what I should talk about. A thought came into my head: if we use the same measure of grace that we do on the failed stars of the Christian world, the Ravi's of the Christian world, if we use that same measure of grace on the authors of the Bible, what would happen to the Book of Psalms, the Book of Proverbs? What would happen to Peter's letters, seeing he denies Christ amongst the Galatians? What would happen to them? My wife, when I asked her the same morning what I should preach on, because I was concerned. I was, this is, it was Wednesday morning. And she says, grace. Preach on grace. So I thought about grace again. I thought about what it means and then what it doesn't mean. And I thought about this text from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 10, this text that we have uh, read two Sundays in a row. It's my prayer that this morning we'll have a fresh revelation of the grace of God and the eternal revelation, of, of the eternal relevance of it. Remember that this letter, Paul's letter to the Ephesians, was, uh, was written not to the world, but written to a Christian community in Ephesus that Paul loved like no other. He loves them. So, Ephesians 2, 1 to 10. Uh, I'm reading from the New American Standard because that's the Bible I like. So, uh, so it may not look like yours. That's all I'm saying. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the prince of the power of the air of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them, we too, all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But God, being rich in mercy, 
because of his great love with which he has loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, so that we would walk in them. Let's pray. Father, we, we want to come under your word today. In our mind, in our heart, in our emotions, in our will. We want to ask that you would mould and shape us. Holy Spirit, we pray you will be powerful today in this word. That you would work in us. That you would speak to us. And share your heart with us. Each of us as individuals and collectively we pray. In Jesus name. Amen. This is a great passage. Yeah. I love this passage. It's a powerful passage. Overflowing with goodness and truth, without which we cannot do. We can't just make it up as we go along. It's a before and after passage. I like before and after passages, they're good. Paul reminds them of their before and after, the before they came to salvation, after they had received the gift of salvation from God. The scope of Paul's audience is, audience is limited and is narrow. Is the church at Ephesus. By God's grace, we get to have this truth as well. A gift written for us and given to us. The before picture is nothing any of us can be proud of. The before picture is everyone's before picture. Everybody. It's not just the before picture of the especially depraved, the especially wicked. It's not just their before picture. We sort of had that beautifully explained over communion, didn't we? It's the picture of everyone. Every human who has walked on the face of the earth except for Jesus. If this is not your before picture, then the after picture can't be yours either. It's only going to be both or none. In the eyes of God, who is love, yeah, God is love. We were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest, even as the most wicked, even as the most depraved idol worshippers and haters of God. We were children of wrath. We would be right in saying we were no better than those who made God in their own image. Who like Adam and Eve, if you were here last week, fell short of the glory of God's standards, were rebellious, desiring to be God themselves. We're no better than any there. Now God's wrath is a part of God's love. We can't have it without it. We can't have God's love without his wrath. Without his wrath, his love would become polluted. It would no longer be holy. And we know, don't we, we know that holiness is that attribute that our eternal creator has. It covers everything he says and he does. This is why in the scriptures it says that he is holy, holy, holy. Let's not forget, let's not put it away. Let's not think that it's not real or true. He is holy, holy, holy. Perhaps we say he's holy, holy. God's wrath is his righteous anger against sin, sin so ably described last week by Andrew. This description in verses 1 to 3 describes people 
who are God's enemies, whose allegiance is to the prince of the power of the air, the devil, Satan, the deceiver. While we would not think that is what we were, that we, were, uh, we gave our allegiance to him, we might not think that's what we were, we did nevertheless live according to his rules. We did live according to his ways. From the least to the best of us, we lived according to his ways. And I expect that not everyone here would be happy with that assessment. They would say, Richard, you've been too hard on me, on mine, on the people I know and live with saying that their allegiance is to the prince of the power of the air, to the devil, the deceiver. And this is what, but this is, this is what Paul is saying, yeah? That's what he says. He says, this is what you were. And this is what God is saying, because this is God's word. So God's assessment. But let's unpack the idea of wrath just for a moment more. We don't want to spend too long on this, because it's not very pleasant. In the Old Testament, there are literally hundreds of references to a day. On this day is a phrase repeated lots and lots of times. Sometimes that day is called the day of the Lord. Those of you who are familiar with the Old Testament, will, will these, they will, this will remind you, you will know. I'm not making it up. <laughs> Read any of the major prophets, it's in there over and over and over again. Often the day has to do with judgment upon God's people who have abandoned him for the seduction of other religions, the seduction of those experiences and feelings. Sometimes it has to do with God's judgment on other nations who have oppressed God's people. Sometimes it points to salvation for people, both God's chosen nation and for others who have come to him in repentance and faith. To, 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 to cut the discussion a little short, Help us move forward. The day of the Lord is both for us, you and I, a past and future day. It's a day when God's wrath is poured out against sin. A day God's wrath was poured out on Jesus. And also is a day yet to come when the wrath of God will be expended on all those whose heart is aligned with the prince of the power of the air. God's wrath is not completely exhausted on Jesus. There is a day, a day of judgment to come. But Paul affirms this in Romans 2.12. He says this. Romans 2.16. This will take place on the day when God judges people's secrets through Jesus Christ. That's my gospel declares. It's part of the good news. This judgment. And when God judges people through Jesus, his judgment is holy and true. This is why the discipline, the censure, the promises given by Jesus to those seven churches in Revelation, those seven churches we've just finished talking about, this is why they carry so much weight. We remember those seven churches, they came after Jesus, didn't they? Yeah. And yet the, the promises and the censure, the discipline, often look forward to that day. If the entire wrath of God for all sin and rebellion, even that sin of unbelief, fell on Jesus when he died for us, then the threat of future judgment or even the promise of future blessings for persevering would hold very little sway for believers. But the fact that it did make a difference means both the glory of the promises and the terror of censure encouraged the correct life response. There is wrath to come. And while we might have a surety about our salvation, in that none can snatch us from the hands of the Father, we must be mindful that we cannot take that for granted. As if we are good enough, worthy in ourselves for this grace, this salvation, I'm reminded of the words of Hebrews 2, verses 1 to 4. We must, pay care, we must pay the most careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard, so that we do not drift away. 
For since the message spoken through angels was binding and every violation and disobedience received its just punishment, how shall we escape if we ignore so great a salvation? This salvation, which was first announced by the Lord, was confirmed to us by those who heard him. God also testified to it by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. But when we think that we don't need to pay careful attention to that message, to that grace, when we think we have obtained it or gained it in any way, earned the benefits of Jesus and the cross, if we have, if we have felt that, because we have done something, we then gain access to what Jesus has done. Please hear this. When we do that, we trade what Jesus has done for us some other way to be reconciled to God, to be forgiven by God. We've traded what Jesus has done for something that doesn't exist. For an illusion, a, uh, a vapour, a deception. Thankfully, our passage in Ephesians continues here. Yeah? From verse 4. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he has loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. So that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his work, created in Christ Jesus, for good works which God prepared beforehand, so that we could walk in them. God's grace begins with God. God is not responding to our situation. He's not responding to you. He's not pitying you. He's not in any other way moved by you. I know this because God is moved by his mercy. God is moved by his love. He's moved by his free will. And I'm sure you will know this. That God and God alone is free. God and God alone. There's no one else who is free. We talk about free will. We talk about having it. We talk about how we have to exercise it. And about how without it we can't choose God. And well, what I read here is something a little bit different. It doesn't quite support that argument. When we were all exercising our free will, we were children of wrath. That was where we were when we exercised our free will. We were children of wrath. And let me tell you, the Bible does not say that I came to my senses and exercised my free will and chose God. In fact, the Bible says the exact opposite. None chooses Him. None wants Him. None hunger for God. But God is where we're at. But God when we were headed for wrath, a righteous wrath, a just wrath, God intervened. When we were about to get our wages, our just compensation for our actions and our attitudes, God acted. God exercised his free will and acted on his love for us. God did not have to love us this way. God would still be loved without acting on acting toward us. Within himself, God is love. Perfect love. God did not have to show abundant mercy. He did not have to act at all. He would still be holy and just. He would still be love. Perfect love without us. But the choice God makes the attribute he exercises when he acts in his intervention in this but God action is grace. Is grace. God, God's love is my grace. We're made alive together with Christ. 
by grace. We are raised up with Jesus by grace. And by grace the Father has seated us together with Jesus in the heavenly places. If you think you have to work to get there, if you have to earn it, we're never going to be able to. The whole of salvation from beginning to end is by grace. Access to this grace is by faith. By believing in Jesus. Again, it's not a works thing. It's a grace thing. It's a gift thing. Some might argue that in, uh, in verse 8, the gift is only related to grace. Grace is the gift, not faith. The faith is the choice. Faith is the exercise of free will. For by grace you have been saved through faith, not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not as a result of work, so that none may boast. But let me tell you, grace is always a gift. Grace is always a gift. Grace can never be deserved. It can never be earned. It is by definition free. Grace is never other than free. If you think you had to earn grace, it's not grace. If you think there's an end to grace, it's not grace. If you think uh, grace, uh, we have to stop abusing grace because otherwise you'll affect grace and you'll damage grace. Well, you can't. Because grace is grace because it can be abused. Grace is always free. Grace is always a gift. Always. It's redundant to say that, that the gift here, the free gift of God is only grace. It must be faith. God gives us faith. So that none of us can boast. Not one of us. We all received faith by God, by his gift. God gives us the faith we need to believe in the one whom he sent. Even Jesus Christ, the crucified and risen Saviour. But then, what about the ongoing work of grace? And this is probably where it becomes, we build on the foundation. Yeah. The ongoing work of grace. What's the continuing relationship with grace? That those beneficiaries of what God has done for them in Christ... What's the ongoing relationship with that? What does that mean? Is grace something that allows us to do anything we like? And grace will cover us and apply the blood of Jesus to us. Is it that grace will connect us with the forgiveness we need that will cover every sin we will ever do so that we should not withhold ourselves from any pleasure in our life? Is grace just like a magic potion that frees us from any and all eternal responsibilities because we've said a sinner's prayer once and let him into our hearts? This is what Paul says. Well, this is actually what God says through Paul in his letter to Titus. Chapter 2, verses 11 to 14, about the ongoing work of grace. It's really important. Not that the rest haven't been really important. It's all really important. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. This is now the continuing work of grace. Yeah? Instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously and godly in the present age. Looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Saviour. Christ Jesus, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. There's a lot there. We have spent another sermon unpacking that. But not this morning, because there's a picture that tells us our words, or two and a half thousand words, which is probably the average length of a sermon, 20, 25 minutes sermon. But what God is saying here is that underscoring our ongoing relationship 
with grace. Why do we have grace? Grace is not just so it can cover everything. But grace is so that we might change. We might change in our relationship with, with it, in our relationship to the world around us. Instructing us to deny ungodliness. Isn't that a good thing? Who's challenged by sin in their life? I am. I am. Sometimes I'm both of Levi's expressions. <laughs> yeah. We struggle with it. But grace is what teaches us to say no. Not fear of punishment or desire for, for reward. It's God's grace that teaches us. Jesus says it much better than I do. He says a parable, tells a parable in Luke 19. We're going to finish with this. Um, Luke 19, 11 to 27. While they were listening to these things, Jesus went on to tell a parable because he was near Jerusalem. And they supposed that the kingdom of God was going to appear immediately. So he said... A nobleman went to a distant country to receive a kingdom for himself and then return. And he called ten of his slaves and gave them ten minas or minas. Minas. Doesn't matter. Matters not. And he said to them, Do business with this until I come back. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, We do not want this man to reign over us. When he returned, after receiving the kingdom, he ordered that these slaves, to whom he had given the money, be called to him, so that he might know what business they had done. The first appeared, saying, Master, your mina has made ten minas more. And he said to him, Well done, good slave. Because you have been faithful in a very little thing, you are able to be in authority over ten cities. The second came, saying, your minute master has made five minutes. And he said to him also, you are to be over five cities. Another came, saying, Master, here is your minna, which I kept, which I kept put away in a handkerchief. For I was afraid of you, because you are an exacting man. You take up what you did not lay down and reap what you did not sow. And he said to him, by your own words I will judge you, you worthless man. Did you know that I'm exacting man, taking up what I did not lay down and reaping what I did not sow? Then why did you not put my money in the bank? And having come, I would have collected it with interest. Then he said to the bystanders, Take the minute away from him and give it to the one who has ten minutes. And they said to him, Master, he has ten minutes already. I tell you that everyone who has, more shall, more shall be given. But from the one who does not have, even what he does have shall be taken away. But these enemies of mine, who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slay them in my presence. It's a great story. And on the surface, it doesn't immediately lend itself to grace. And yet, when we scratch a little deeper, there it is. The ruler comes, doesn't he? By grace. He just comes, he comes and receives a kingdom to himself. Some say we don't want him to rule over us. He gives gifts. And you know, you might be one of the ten minute people. You might be. You might have invested what God has given you, the grace that He's given you, and might be living a life that is so pleasing to Him. A life that that blesses Him so much. You might be a five minute person. I wouldn't mind being a five minute person. Yeah. You also might be a one minute person who's buried the grace of God. 
not in their decision like that. You might even be a person who doesn't want Jesus to reign over you. You might be one of those. Whoever you are, take this opportunity to respond to the grace of God. To respond to his free gift to you. Even if you're a 10 or a 5, we still need to respond and invest in the grace of God. Respond to that grace which interrupts our stories with but God. That grace which saves us through faith from the wrath that is to come. The grace that instructs us to deny our gods a world we desire to live sensibly, righteously and godly in this present age. That grace which encourages us to look or equips us with a, with a blessed hope and appearing for the glory of our great God and Saviour, Christ Jesus. Whoever we are, let's invest God's grace. That gift that is always a gift, let's invest God's grace by allowing it to instruct and transform us. Giving us an eternal perspective and hope in Jesus that we might be to the praise of his glory. This is an opportunity. Today. And if today we hear his voice, a hard your heart, don't say it's not me. Don't say it's somebody else. He's talking to somebody else. But it is you. God speaks to us individually and personally. Let's pray. Father God, we want to thank you for this day. Thank Opportunity. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your spirit. We pray you might wrestle with us. That we might not just drop what you're saying to us and go on living lives as if you've never spoken. Holy Spirit, come. Moving us, grab hold of us, change us, we pray, that we might be to the praise of his glory.